Hi, everybody. Hi. The Parviews are back. And they're not Gilligan and Skipper. They made it. So you might be one to ask why I have these notebooks in my hand. You guys are really good. <laughs> Usually it takes a couple of, yeah, like that's, I love people that take notes. I think that people that take notes are awesome. Are you a person that takes notes? <laughs> yeah, who wants to pass these out? Oh, you? Awesome. Awesome. I think it's just so cool when people take notes, you know. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, just, it's, it's that person that just really, really, really wants to get to know the Lord, and, and they take notes while they're at, at a church service, or they take notes while they're studying, and, and they go back and they rip the Bible open and they, they check it, you know, and they want to make sure that what they're being fed is the truth. And so uh, I've said this before, I get a lot of flack for it, but I don't care. Uh, don't just take my word on it just because I have a microphone on. That doesn't mean I know everything. And so uh, ultimately we all have to make our own decisions because we all have to, to stand before the Lord someday. Thank you, Michael. We have to stand before the Lord someday and give an account for our life. Uh, what I have to do is I have to give an account for what I say, but what you have to give an account for is what you believe. And so I want to make sure that you have every opportunity to take some notes and check the scriptures when you go home. I think that would be great. And then please, uh, if you have any, any questions you'd like to ask of me, I would be more than happy to entertain them and we could sit and reason together. That would be awesome. So please take some notes. If you need a pen, uh, there's some pens outside this door uh, in Jessica's hand. <clears throat> so you made me a liar. They're not outside the door anymore. They're inside the door. Anyway, in Jessica's hand. Again, I want to welcome some new faces. It's good to see some new faces in here. It's always good to see people that I know and love. And I hope that the new faces will transition quickly into the people that I know and love. That would be great. Um, we, we started uh, a series back in June 24th. We kind of uh, lifted off in our airplane and we were going to study through the book of Joshua. It was June 24th. It's been a long time, you know, pretty much all summer. Uh, it's been a good time. And uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of land the plane tonight. Uh, but starting next week, we're going to start a new series. And I don't know exactly how long it's going to take because every time I try to put a, a time frame on it, it never works. So I'm just going to say that we're going to start a new series starting next week. And it's called The God of the Mountain, The God of the Valley. And we're going to try our very best using God's Word, led by His Spirit, to understand that God is with us no matter where you are, no matter what's going on. His presence can be felt and experienced no matter what. So we're going to start that next week. And I'm looking forward to, to jumping back into God's Word with you and seeing what He has for us. But anyway, tonight we, uh, we're going to finish up the, the book of Joshua. What I'm going to do is kind of recap so I've been, I've been praying this week, you know, like, Lord, what do I do with this week? Uh, the series comes to an end. Uh, and so I think it was just a little rewind. We would just want to recap. Not all of you are here every single week. So all this, this might just be absolutely fresh material for you. You'd be like, hey, that's great. Some of you have been here every week, and that is awesome. But I'm sure because God's Word is unique in the fact that it's alive. So anytime we dig into it, you might have read it a hundred times. You read the same sentence, and you're going to go, was that in there? You know what I mean? So we're, hopefully we're going to get something, uh, all of us will get something out of it. But what, what he shared with me is just to kind of go through the main points. And so I was kind of digging through my notes and praying and stuff. And, and what I, I, I've done is I've, I've come up with uh, six major points. I'm just going to kind of come at, come at you real quick. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to, and that's a great place to get your notebooks out. And you can, re, you can write those things down. And then check them. But before we do, I just want to uh, go back to when we started. You know, we, we started the book of Joshua, the study, answering a question that's at the end of the book of Joshua, which was, choose today whom you'll serve. And we, so we started out with that. We're going to end up with that. But the reason why we, we started this book of uh, study through the book of Joshua was basically to see how God delivers his people through uh, Yeshua. And Joshua, his Hebrew name is Yeshua, right? And so God used Yeshua to deliver his people to a place of rest. And today, of course, uh, this same name, Yeshua, God uses Yeshua, Jesus, to deliver us to a place of rest. It's not geography. It's a place of rest in our soul. 
Um, we, we're studying this, even though it's a very old book, but um, we study this because back then, just like now, we have great challenges. They have great challenges in life, didn't we? Uh, and we have great expectations laid upon us. Um, in our life as we're moving forward, we're going to have trouble and we're going to have calamity and we're going to have danger. And who knows what's, I mean, we don't even know what tomorrow, I mean, really, you know what I'm saying? Like, who knows what tomorrow brings, but we're gonna, it's going to be something. And, if, and, and I know you guys, there's never a dull moment. There's never, I don't I can't speak of any other church, but I know up in here, there's never a dull moment. Something's coming. If you're not in it right now, don't blink because it's coming. We got trouble. We got danger up ahead. When we study through the book of Joshua, we see that, uh, you know, in, in their context, you see that they were going to uh, pass over into the promised land. They have to cross over the Jordan River. And it says in the scripture that the Jordan, it was during uh, a season when it was o rushing over its banks. So it wasn't just like a little creek. It was, and they have to go across this thing. This is a great challenge. Of course, when they get there, if they get there, right, there's great armies in front of them that they have to fight to try to conquer this land. So that's up ahead of them. Of course, Moses, their great leader, is now dead. So there's some great expectations that kind of went to the grave with him, probably with the, with the vision of the people going, man, he, he's dead. So now he's dead, and that, uh, this whole responsibility now is lumped onto Joshua, so I'm, I'm sure that he's probably kind of stressed out about it. So back then, that was going on with them. But for us, you know, we have issues too. I'm sure we're not crossing the Jordan River, but we have relational issues, and we've got money problems. Yeah, I thought I'd get way more than one amen out of that one. Uh, but we have past wounds that we're dealing with, um, experiences from the past, and cultural expectations that are laid upon us every single day. I mean, the culture is just wearing you out, right? Everywhere you go, everything you do, it's like wham, wham, wham. They're trying to conform you into an image all the time. TV, computer, your phone, billboards, magazines, people, right? Always hammering you, saying, do this and do this and do that. And, and all the while... God is just asking you, like, it's all coming, right? And God's asking you, who will you serve? I mean, it's coming, right? And so all of us want a good result. Who wants a good result? Who wants a good tomorrow, right? We all do. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. We all want a good result. We want a better tomorrow than we had yesterday. And God's like, listen, I want the same thing for you. And so choose today whom you will serve. You want to do it the world's way and all these other ways, or you want to do it my way. That was the, that was the way we started out. He said all kinds of stuff going on daily that we're dealing with, but here, I want the best for you. And so we see at the beginning of the book of Joshua, when we first started studying it, we see this over at the very, uh, in the very first chapter in verse uh, 8, it says this. Um, study this book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night. There's that note thing, right? There's that note thing. Uh, meditate on it day and night. Why? So you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. See, that's what he wants us. We talked about that early on, this idea of prospering, this idea of shalom, this idea, see, a lot of people just, like, they know the shalom thing is like the Hebrew thing for high. Hello, shalom. But there's more to that. See, shalom means an overall prosperity in every facet of your life. Not just like a successful dad, but a terrible husband. Not like a good teacher, but a horrible daughter. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like I am, I'm wealthy. My finances are in order, but my, but my marriage is a wreck. Like, it's, it's good and bad. No, overall Gospel prosperity is every single facet of your life is healthy and at peace. Here, we, we, we read this a while back. I'll reiterate it again. Third John chapter 1, verse 2, it says this. Uh, Beloved, I pray that in all respects, in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. You see, what he's saying here is that upon salvation, when you bent the knee to Jesus and his spirit came to live inside of you, your soul was prosperous. Like it had no more longings, no more worries, no more, no more deficiencies, no more concerns. It was complete, your soul was completely healed at that moment of conversion. And what he's saying here is shalom, prosperity means just like your soul was completely healed, I want your life completely healed in the same way. That's what I want for you. Signed, Jesus. That's what he wants for us all. 
So, what do we do? It says to look at the book of instruction and meditate on it and do everything it says. So we got an expression around here, right? Open it, read it, and do it. That's what we've been saying since this church started five years ago. And it would seem easy, right? Heck no. It's not easy. It's not easy. I would think it'd be easy, but it's not. Why? Because God's going to ask you to do some stuff you don't want to do. Right? He's going to ask you to do some crazy things. Maybe he's going to tell you to go scream at a wall. That's what he, he told him to do that in Jericho, right? Go scream at a wall. You know, yeah, okay, Father. Son, stand still. Like, that's, that's, that's going to work. He had no biblical precedent, no historical precedent that that would ever work. Son, stand still. That's kind of crazy, right? Go cross a river that's gushing over its banks. What's that have to do with you? Go forgive someone that busted you up bad. Go give generously when you're broke. Go submit to your husband in all things as unto the Lord. That's a tough one, isn't it? Come on, ladies. It's tough, right? But it says it, right? God tells you to do some crazy stuff. Submit to your husband in all things like he was Jesus? Woo! I didn't think it would be Gabe leaving the room. I thought it would be all the wives leaving the room. Right? It's, it's not easy, right? It's scary. It might hurt. I might fail. I might get hurt. I might die. But God says, in the face of that fear, proceed. Proceed. Be strong. Be strong meaning hold up under the weight of that pressure. Be courageous. Look at the fear and go, you know what? This is scaring me to death. But I'm going to do it anyway. And God says to the single mom, go raise those kids. Just go do it one more day. Come on, you can do it, honey. You can do it one more day. And he looks at the, the, the man at the office who's being, who's being, who's being uh, uh, there's a flirt there in the office. He's being hit on. Be strong and courageous and say no to her. And he looks at the teenager and he says, everyone's coming against you. And, it, and here, drink and smoke and do all these bad things. And you feel like your reputation's on the line. But he says, be strong and say no to it. Why? The text tells us why. Because God says, I'm with you. Because I'm with you. And I'll give you strength. Let me ask you a question. Who in this room, honestly, we're here to lift each other up. Who has ever forgiven someone that they couldn't stand and they didn't want to forgive them? Keep your hand up a second. Now, show of hands. How many people who did that felt better about it now? Trust God. Trust God. How many people have ever given their last, they tithed off their last, and they're here to talk about it. Trust God. Trust God. Romans 8, 28 says that all things will work together for the good to those who love the Lord, right? We all want good. You all said, I want a better tomorrow than I had yesterday. But he's like, listen, if you want my promise to come true in, in your life, you know I'm with you, and I have a way for you to do it. If you want my promise in your life, you got to do it my way. You got to do it my way, even if you're scared, even if it hurts. Know that I'm with you, and I'll get you through it. Now, machine gun, you ready? Six things. Six things. Six things that it means. When we choose to serve Him, here's six things that it means. Choosing God means to, and this is for you to write down, write this stuff down. Choosing God means to not choose yourself. Now, that could, be, that could take on a lot of different meanings, right? But it's not, like, it's not like that other biblical mandate about considering other people more important than you. That's not what we're talking about here, although that's true. Other people, you're more important than me. And you're more important than me. That's just the way it has to be. In the Christian walk, that's the way it's got to be. Everyone else before yourself. That's it, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is, 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 is when, when you're faced with, with fears and challenges and an adversity, like the self-help aisle at the, at the bookstore is not where you need to go. Okay, there, there should be caution tape 
on the self-help aisle at the bookstore. Okay? It's not going to work. We don't go to ourselves to, to, to go and find the solution to problems. A better Moses is not going to inspire anybody. Okay? It's not going to work. Okay? I'm broken. And out of broken people come broken ideas and broken programs, and there's no solution there, right? So we got to look elsewhere. So it's not looking at yourself. Well, well, now, that sounds good, and I'm yelling at you, so it was like, oh, he must be telling the truth. That's not it, okay? But here's the, here's the biblical truth, and we talked about this, and everyone always laughs, but it's, it's kind of not funny, but Jeremiah 17, 9, that you can't go to yourself for the solution because your heart, just follow your heart. Anyone ever, you hear that on Facebook, right? Go follow your heart. Yeah. Your heart is deceitful above all things. It's more deceitful than this chair. It's more deceitful than a politician. It is. You know why? Because they have one too. It's deceitful above all things. It will lie to you. You know who's hurt you more than anyone else? Me. No, no, not me. Me hurt me the most. I didn't hurt I hope I didn't hurt you guys the most. I've hurt myself the most when I think of a great idea and I fall on my face. Why? Because I didn't do what the scriptures say in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. To lean not on my own understanding, but seek God's will in all, say all please, in all that you do, and he will make straight your paths. He will, he will direct your steps. He will, he'll show you the way. You all said you wanted a better tomorrow than you had yesterday, and you want to get there based on his promises and his power. He'll show you the way if you acknowledge him and seek his will in all that you do, not your own. I'm not able. I'm not able. Broken people make broken systems and broken plans. So really, when we were studying Joshua, the study of one of the greatest leaders of all time, it was not because he was brilliant, it's not because he was big and strong. It's not because he came up with the best plan. Why was he a great leader? Well, if you read the book of Joshua, you know that he was constantly listening and to God and doing what he said. That's why he was a great leader. And that's why you can be a great leader if you will listen to what the Lord says and walk with him. You can't listen to yourself because you're broken. We have to listen to the only unbroken one. Colossians 2.6 tells us also that, and now just as you accepted Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. What does that mean? Well, it means that when you came to Jesus, this is just more of the same thing. When you came to Jesus, you realized that you couldn't do anything right. I mean, year after year, you're trying. New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve, I'm going to be better. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Bust, 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 right? And so finally, you're just like, I can't do this anymore, right? So you come to Jesus, How? Needy, broken, fearful, out of ideas, back to the drawing board, totally humble, like, Lord, I just got to put my life in your hands. Like, I, 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 right? I got, I got nothing. What am I going to, so you come to him like that, and you're like, Lord, I put my life in your hands that day. Do you remember the day you said yes the first time? So that's what you did, right? You came to him. You're like, I'm humble, right? I got nothing. Help me, please. I'm falling apart. And what this scripture says is every day you should be doing that. Every single day you're supposed to acknowledge him in everything you do. Seek his will in every single thing that you do. So just like you did that first day, Lord, I just want to do it your way. Take over. Jesus, take the wheel. Every single day you should be doing the same exact thing. If, and it's a big if, and listen, it's up to you if you want your path straight. If you want all things to work out for the good, that's what you do. You can't sidetrack it. You can't phone it in. You can't, you can't work the system, work the pay plan, try to get there by doing anything else. There's only one way. Seek his will in all that you do. Book of Romans 13, uh, verse 4, same thing. He says, don't, don't look at yourself. It's never going to work that way. He said, make no provision for the flesh. Zero provision for the flesh. That means don't listen to anything that you think. Oh, I got a great idea. No, you don't. He's like, no, make no provision for the flesh. What do we do instead? Well, then what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Galatians 5.25, follow the Spirit. 
in all things. You know what you do when you wonder? What should I do? What should I do? You know that this, this Holy Spirit, he's kind of a, ooh, like I don't understand that. You know, it's like God the Father is cool and God the Son, but God the Spirit, ooh, everyone's like frightened. They're either like all in or they're like totally out, right? God the Spirit inspired men to write a book. Did you guys know that? He, 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 this is the Holy Spirit inspired. Every single word of it. So if like you want to know what to do, take notes. Right? So it's not just listening to me. You go home and you, and you bring to the Lord your question. And you search the scriptures. And you, and you write down your questions. And you write down your answers. That's what you do. That's what you do. And I'm telling you that Holy Spirit is so faithful to lead you to the right verse. Man, it's unbelievable. I can't, it kind of, freak, that kind of stuff freaks me out. When you're like, when you have a question and you're like, oh, and you open it up, it's like, that's the page. Like, wouldn't that freak you out, right? It happens. Who's ever had that happen? <laughs> Spooky, right? But it happens. It happens. Make no provision for the flesh. Follow the Spirit in all things, okay? First thing, choosing God means not choosing yourself. Here's the second thing. Choosing God means choosing community. Amen? Andy, come on now. It's supposed to be on cue. Choosing God means choosing community. Yes, okay, all right, better. <laughs> so, you know, I got news for you. Like, grandma and grandpa didn't save you. You know what I mean? Like, grandma and grandpa went to church your whole, their whole life, and they've been praying for you and everything. That's awesome, but they, never, they didn't save you. And, 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 you, and mama didn't save you, and your nationality didn't save you, and your good deeds didn't save you, and just because you're a Republican, that doesn't mean you're saved. Did you know that? Did you know that? See, the, the, the singular belief and trust in Jesus saves you. That's it. That's it, right? That's it. But listen, although salvation is, is, is singular, it's like salvation is, is from one, just in Jesus, and it's really, in my case, it's just for me, right? I can't save Jared, although he needs it. I can't save him, right? So it's, it's salvation from one to one, but when I get saved, I'm saved by one, but to many. You see, we're, we're, we're in community. We're, we're saved to each other. We're saved to each other, right? And uh, the Scriptures calls us the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 2.5 says that we're God's spiritual temple. That's us. Um, let me give you some, some, uh, um, some references here. You can look them up, and I know that you will. Ephesians 4 says that God places us together, and here's a great word, perfectly. He places us together perfectly, which means you didn't stumble upon this church. Right, you had, let, me tell you what you had, you, let me tell you what you had to do with that. Nothing. You had nothing to do with that. God brought you here. He places us together perfectly. So it's by no mistake or coincidence that, you may, that brings you here to this church. Some of you have been fighting to get away, but you keep coming back. Why is that? Now, yeah, if you tried to leave, it's because you weren't happy, but you're still here. Why? Ooh, there's that Holy Spirit again. Woo! Right? Because he keeps drawing you back. Because he places us together perfectly. Now, once you realize why you're here, this is the next part of the verse. He places us together perfectly. Why? So that when each part does its own special work, it helps all the others. And when that happens, the entire church, right, all of us, are healthy, growing, and full of love. That's the kind of church I really want to be part of. I want to be a part of a church that is healthy and growing and full of love. But two things have to happen here. You have to realize that God puts you here. So it's not let go of the kicking and screaming. It's, it's time to just go, okay, I got it. So you're here. Okay, now I'm here because God put me here. Now what? We talked, right? Now he put me here. But there's next words, remember? And as each person does his own 
special work. So you all got dragged in, kicking and screaming. You've all been given a gift, an ability, and a talent. You all have, so you have resources at your disposal. I'm not talking about your cash. I'm talking about all your capacities. He says if you will use those, you'll help the rest of us. And the whole church, which is all of us and the people that aren't here tonight, will be healthy. Who wants healthy? Please, everyone, raise their hand. <laughs> Chef, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to throw a chair at you. Okay. <laughs> Loving, <laughs> healthy, growing, and full of love. That's the kind of church. Man, I think, I would, I, wouldn't that be great if every church in the world was like that? Every church. That they wouldn't talk about that one church that was like, man, why is that thing growing like that? Because they all were doing it. Woo, that, okay, let's forget it. Okay, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Okay. <laughs> so here, here's, here's, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You don't, have to, you don't have to look it up. You don't have to read it, but you read it later. It's, it talks, Paul talks about, inspired by the Holy Spirit, you, 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 it says there's one body, right? And he uses the human body as an example. But there's several parts. Can you imagine if the whole body of Christ were hands? We could do a lot of work, except we wouldn't know what to do because there was no brain attached to it. I can fix your car. I just don't know how. I'll mow your grass, but what's this lawnmower thing? Because, I mean, can you imagine that? What if we were all ears to, to hear the problems that are going on in our culture, but yet we had no hands to go do it? Kind of stupid, right? Wouldn't work. And that's the way it is with the body of Christ. It's all one body, but there's all different people in it that can do different things. Romans 15 says to aim for harmony. So most translations don't use aim. They use pursue harmony. That means intentionally going after different people. Right? That there's no cookie cutter Christians. Now, I don't know if you look up Christian in an encyclopedia what the picture's going to look like, but it better be a lot of pictures. Because the body of Christ is, is to be harmonious, which means, I've said this before, I'll beat this drum to death, that it's, that it's together because when they all come together, they make a greater sound, a greater expression that any single part can do on their own. Did you hear when all of a sudden they started, the girls started harmonizing up there? I, could, I almost jumped out of my skin. They're all great singers, but when, they, when all three of them went wham, it was like, whoa, yeah. That's harmony, right? That's harmony. That's what we need in the body of Christ. But we have to, so we can come together as one voice. But listen, we have to pursue that. We have to be actively looking and seeking and embracing people of different looks and styles, ethnicities, age, whatever. We're a non-denominational church. So we welcome in, if Jesus is Lord, that's it. The rest of it we can have committees about. I won't come to the committee meeting, but you guys can have them all you want. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You know, when you look in, in the book of Acts, Acts 2 and Acts chapter 4, it's like constant display of this. Everybody sharing everything, meeting every day for the goodwill of every person, right? All these different types of people coming together, right? There was rich and there was poor and there were doctors and lepers and in, in our culture, what, police and prisoners and prostitutes and presidents and young and old, black, white, rich, poor. It doesn't make any difference. It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. And since Genesis 1.26 says that we're all made, every one of us, all made in the image of God, that means that no one person has the market cornered on Christ-likeness. It takes every single one of us to paint a full display of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. So we have to welcome all types of people in. Diversity, harmony. Another important part of community, though, um, I don't know if you guys remember this. You remember, I think it was in chapter 7, we met our buddy Aiken. Aiken was the guy who, who was part of this community of believers, and, and they had this war, and he he kind of took some stuff that he shouldn't. And God had told them, like, when you bust into the city and win, don't take these things. And so he's like, and he put it in his tent, and he hid it, right? And God's like, uh, no, I, I told you, right? So what did, what did God do? He did what coaches do that we hate. Oh, you messed up? Okay, the rest of you do push-ups. Right, anyone have a coach like that? 
That's the coach that God was. Okay, Aiken, you messed up. It's all of your fault. <laughs> but see, they, they pronounced judgment. And God used the community to stone him and his family and kill him. But today, you know, your community is so awesome. We have better promises, a better covenant. You know what he uses the community for now? Not to stone each other, but to get together and pray for one another to bring healing. Same community, right? Except I don't stone you anymore. I pray for you. You confess your sin to me. I confess my sin to you. We find healing and strength and encouragement. That's what he uses the community for now. But the point of the story is that everything that you do, it affects all the other people in your community. Is this choice I'm about to make, what's it going to do to Wendy? How's it going to affect you? Before I step in and make a decision, how's it going to affect you? I'm about to do this, how's it going to affect Katie? What's it going to mean to Grayson? That's why the Bible says we should esteem others above ourselves. Because I'm about to do this and I'm going to like it, it's going to benefit me, but it's really going to hurt Grayson. And if I love him, I won't do it. It gets awful quiet when we talk about stuff like this. It's not the hoorah party, is it? But it's truth. We're all in this together. And everything that we do, everything I do affects you and everything you do affects me and all around the room. We're our brother's keeper, right, Frank? We're our brother's keeper. Yeah. Here's the third thing. Choosing God means choosing to celebrate God's victories. And some of this stuff, we've, well, we've gone over all of it, really. If you remember... Um, God is extremely serious about celebrating his victories, proclaiming his wins. That's, he's big on that. Exodus chapter 15, uh, the people of Israel just gone through the Red Sea. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. They turn around and the sea closes down on Egypt and total victory, right? So what happens then? All too many people, they start this huge flash mob. They start singing and dancing. The ladies grab tambourines. And lead. Two million people singing songs, singing songs, celebrating what God had done. Woo! The opening line was this. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. And they sang and celebrated what God had done. That's why we sing and celebrate. When you're in church, that's what we're supposed to do. I can't listen. I'm just going to be total disclosure. I'm not saying that when you go to churches and they're singing hymns that it's not beautiful. I just can't do it. I just can't do it, right? It's not that they're bad. They're, they're great tunes. Some of them, as long as you redo them, they're great. No, I'm just kidding. But, but right? I, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but like, listen, look what it says. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Listen to this one. Psalm 20, verse 5. David said, may we shout for joy when we hear of your victory. You know what I'm saying? Like celebrating what God does. Not like, hey man, that God, that was really rocking what you did there in the Red Sea. Hallelujah, Jesus, amen. <laughs> Dude, what is that? That's like, I'd rather, like, it's like, I'd rather go get my root canal, but they were busy, so praise the Lord. I mean, it's, it's, come on, right? So, so when we sing, right, it's supposed to be like a celebration, like when you go to a funeral, you're, sell, you're singing like somber, quiet songs because the dude's dead. Like, you know what I'm saying? But our Jesus is alive, so you sing songs to an alive king, right? Yeah. Don't do it half hearted. Clap. Let's, let's see what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. If you're going to do it, right? You know what I mean? Like, don't. Well, nobody else is doing it, so I'm done. No, just go at it. You know what I'm saying? Who cares what anybody else says? You're all lame. Who cares what anybody else? Just clap, right? Hoorah! <laughs> lame. Totally lame. Totally lame. He's about to get hurt, isn't he? <laughs> hey, from here back, just careful for red chairs flying. Ooh. And the whole church is filled with love. Listen, when God takes a hill... You know what the hill that God takes is a person. Like geography is important. Like, like back in 1876, God spoke to someone. I don't know who it was. And that person decided to get together with some buddies, and they love Jesus, and they said, let's build this joint. So they built this place. It was 1876. It was first Methodist of Eustace. 
And it's been here for 150 years. It's kind of cool, right? So, like, this is kind of like God's spot. And I, I get that. Like, this is his spot. But, you know, spots kind of come and go. Did you ever notice that there's a mosque on the Temple Mount in Israel? Places kind of come and go. What God's really after are people. That's what he's really after. And, and when, when God takes a hill, it says that, that all, if this is in Luke 15, it says that all of heaven rejoices when a sinner repents and comes to the Lord. When someone's saved, imagine that, like peel back the clouds and see all the, you see we all think that's like, you know, little babies with wings and harps. And it's like powerful angelic beings are partying because someone returned to their daddy. And that's the way, that's, it's on, the, it's in the scriptures, not like, wow, that's a cool story. It's like, no, because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you do when, when someone uh, gets saved, when, when Jesus takes a hill. Uh, and so when we go back to our text, we see that in, in Joshua's day, uh, they were very, very serious about that too. And as a matter of fact, God told them, listen, when you're coming through the Jordan River, I want you to take some big old rocks and I want you to build these huge altars, these big memorials. And so you say, like, well, memorials, I thought you said we weren't singing to a dead guy. We're not. It's not a memorial of a dead guy. It was put there so that anybody who went by it for years to come could, could go, hey, what's that? And people go, hey, let me tell you what Jesus did celebrating what God did, and he put it there, and rocks last a long time. Rocks last a long time. That's why he had them build it with rocks, because it says that I want you to tell about my amazing deeds forever, forever. Don't make it out of wood. Don't make it out of mud. Make it out of a rock. Tons of rocks, big rocks, so it lasts forever. So if someone comes by next week, you can tell them what I did. If someone comes by 150 years from now, you can tell them what I did. If someone comes by 1,000 years from now, you can tell them what I did and celebrate. That's what God wants. He's big time, it's big time pumped up about people celebrating who he is. That's what he wants. Here's the next one. Choosing God means trusting him in some crazy big things. This was the message. This was probably my favorite week going through this book, and it was the message that we titled Praying to the God Who Could. You remember that? Anyone here for that? I remember that. I love that night, man. I love that. What am I talking about? Pray to the God who could? Are you second guessing, my Lord? No, I'm not. I'm saying, sun stand still. So they're in, they're in this war, right? And it's not like now. You know, Ryan, you're in the service, right? You can put in some coordinates to the computer, press a button, and drop that missile in someone's toilet a thousand miles away, right? They didn't have that back then kind of cool. You could have whooped some tail back then if you'd had one of them, right? They didn't do that, right? They, the sun would come up, they'd charge into the field, and whoever's left standing, you win, right? That was it. You, you like literally fought. There was no standing from far back and like shooting. It was like, okay, mano y mano, let's go, man. We're going to see who's going to win right here, right? So, so, so they've got this big battle going, right? And they can't, if it gets dark, you can't see nothing. They didn't have like spotlights. You couldn't call the sheriff's department, hey, bring in some spotlights. We're going to keep slaughtering these guys. Oh, okay. Right? So, so the sun has to come out. So what does he do? So it says that there was never a day in history like this before that God did this. He heard the prayer of a man, Joshua, stand up before his people and go, we need more light, God, so stop letting the earth spin so that the sun will stay right there. Sun, stand still, and it did. He had no biblical or historical precedence that that would ever happen, and it's never happened since. But he stood boldly before all these people, put his reputation on the line, probably thinking, this is not gonna work, right? It's never happened before, never. Sun, stand still, that's the kind of crazy thing I'm talking about. Pray to the God that, that, like, I don't know if he's gonna, but I know, I know, I know that he can. I know that he can. All things are possible. Right? How, 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 about, how about Elijah in front of all the people? Okay, God, I've got all these people over here, and I built this altar, and we poured water all over it. How many people like having a campfire with wet wood? So this is what God does, right? I want you to build an altar. I'm going to throw fire down from heaven, but I want you to pour water all over it. I would have been out at that point. I'm done, right? I'm done. Are you kidding me, God? 
So pour water all over it and then stand up before all the people and say, God, prove to these people that I'm not crazy, that you are the true God, and bring fire down, and wham, fire comes down out of heaven. Pray to the God who could. See, that, that never happens. What, who, who's ever called down fire from heaven, right? No one in here? What, you guys are so lame. But here's the thing. Listen, 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 listen. The book of James says that Elijah was a man just like us. That's permission to pray to the God who could. We don't know if he will, but he could. He can. He, we know he's got the power to do such things. Pray like crazy. Pray for the sun with the, with the, and I dragged Eric up here. I don't even know where he is. He's hiding somewhere. But pray for the sun. And we, used, we talked about Cindy who would pray for her son Eric who was so in a cloud of drugs and alcohol with needles pour, stuck in his arm every single day. And she never gave up. What, 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 is it guaranteed that Eric was going to turn around? No. But he could. And so Cindy never stopped praying for her boy. And today he's delivered. Clean. Clean. <clears throat> Here's the next thing, what it means to choose God. Choosing God means choosing to help others choose God. I, I said this before. I'll say it again. I've said it twice now. The only way to experience the fullness of our salvation the only way to experience the fullness of our salvation is to include in that experience helping others to experience the same. Does that make any sense at all? And we talked about the fact that it's in over in Joshua chapter 1 and then it comes to fruition in Joshua chapter 22 and Joshua tells the people, listen, um, God's given you this area of land over here on the east side of the Jordan and, and it's yours. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours. But listen, before you go have the fullness of your salvation, I need you to go over here with all the rest of these guys and help them find their rest and peace in, where, in their land before you can go over and enjoy the fullness of yours. And that's for us too. That's for us too. We, we have to help others experience the blessing of salvation and intimacy with the Lord or else we will never enjoy fullness of our salvation and intimacy with the Lord. We talked about, uh, have you ever baptized somebody? I asked you if you've, ever been ba if you've ever baptized somebody. And some of you have raised your hand and, and, and that's what I'm talking about. When you're baptizing them, you're like, this person's eternity is changing right now. And, but all the while, you're like, you're getting fired up like there's an experience there that you can never get unless you dunk someone. And, and there's an experience when you're sharing the gospel with someone and you're praying for them and you want them to receive Jesus so bad. And all of a sudden they go, yes, and you can feel your spirit going, woo! Right? You can't get that unless you're sharing the gospel with somebody. Do you know what I'm saying? Or you're just praying with somebody. And you're praying for someone diligently, earnestly, praying for them. And you want to, and, and, you, and you're rooting for them, right? And all the while, while you're doing it, you just feel God just rooting. And, okay, Kashi, you're praying for someone, praying for someone, and all of a sudden you just feel God just loving on you. He's saying, go, Kashi, go, Kashi. Share him with, share me with these people. Tell them about me. And you feel like he's your cheerleader. He's cheering you on. You're helping this person. And all of a sudden, you just feel it from God. You will never have those experiences unless you help other people experience the same. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. John, the apostle, he got it. And he's writing all these things about the faith to teach people. And it says here in chapter 1, verse 4, that we are writing these things so that our joy would be complete. Did you hear that? Pay attention now. I'm writing these things of the faith so you'll believe them, so you'll have joy, right? But it's so that I, I'm going to share this with you. Like when I get up here and talk to you about the Lord and his word, I'm sharing this stuff with you so that my joy can be complete. I know that God has said to Moses, go share me with people. Go open up the book and share the word of God with people. I will never have joy unless I do it. There, there's, there's, there are weeks, let me tell you something, there are weeks when some other man will stand at this pulpit and if you take a look, and I don't want you to because I want you to pay attention to them, I'm in the back just going like this. Like I want to get up there and talk so bad. I can't stand it. 
I need to do that. If I'm not doing that with you, I, 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 I go crazy. I go insane if I can't do that. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. But if, you, if, you, if you're not sharing Jesus with people, it will it'll drive you nuts. You'll explode. One of these days, you're just going to explode. You've got to do it. Okay, enough of that. Uh, here's, the, here's the last thing. Choosing God means choosing to make his thing the main thing. Making his thing the main thing. I'll remind you of a, of a quote that I share with you from Abraham Lincoln. It's not in the Bible, of course. But it was a cool quote. <laughs> and someone asked him during the Civil War if, if, if he thought that God was on his side. Is God on our side? And he answered back. It was just awesome. He said, uh, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. So he understood, you know what I'm saying? He understood, the, he had the proper perspective. Is God on America's side? Mm, well, I'm not sure, but I really hope that America's on God's side. That was a great one for now in our, in our, in our po highly political uh, society right now. It's not a matter of if God's on our side. It's a matter of if we're on, on His. Um, whoa, that thing is broken. Um, that means, really, and when you think about it, that means that our identity um, as, as Christians is, is first and foremost um, a child of God and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's who you are. Now, I know that we're Americans, but first and foremost, you are a child of God and a disciple of Christ above all other things. Amen. Yeah, right? Crickets. <laughs> Not only are, is your first and foremost identity a, a, a disciple of, of Christ, but you have to realize that his thing is your main thing. And so since his main thing is to seek and save that which is lost, then that needs to be your main thing. All of us have, like, we wake up in the morning and... Average person works 40 hours. Most of us work more. I get it. We've got bills and we've got family and friends and stuff and hobbies and sports and all these things. And in all that, it's just a time to like look, at, look in the mirror a little bit. In, in all of that, if you look at your time schedule and your thoughts and everything, is, is, is seeking and saving that which was lost, is that your main thing? I don't know. Some of us, yeah, I know. I know some of you, definitely. But even those people, which I would include myself, could do a lot better. <clears throat> we could do a lot better. See, like I started earlier when we first started out, that, that the culture is, is vying for your attention. And everything in the world around you is vying for the throne of your heart. There's only one throne in all of the universe that's up for grabs. Because all of creation either works on instinct that God gave it, or patterns, like planets that are spinning and moving, bless you. God put those in motion, and they're just doing what he told them to do. Lions just run after gazelles and eat them. There's no thought. There's no, you know, I'm putting on some weight. Maybe I'll be a vegetarian. That's just what they do, right? But there's only one thing in all creation that has free will to choose what sits on its throne, and that's you. And God is vying for that. And so that's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4.23 to, above all things, guard your heart. We must guard our heart. And that is what I'm talking about, making God's thing the main thing of your life because everything is vying for that spot, including God. But there's only one person, thing, entity, whatever you want to call God. He's God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. But He is vying for the throne of your heart, and only He is worthy to sit on it. And He is jealous of that throne. He does not, he's not willing or wanting to share the throne of your heart with any other thing. I don't care if it's a political party, a nation, a sport. It doesn't make it, He will not compete with your family, your husband, your wife, your kids, your church, your government, your sport. He will not ever, ever give up. He doesn't sneak over and share seats with someone. Only one deserves the throne of your heart. And that's God. And that's God. 
So we must choose the main thing, and it has to be God's thing. You know, in this time of political craziness, I just have to tell you, I've got to say it one more time, that Ben Carson, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, whatever you're deciding who you're going to vote for, I can tell you right now that none of them ever willingly went to the cross to pay for your sin. And none of them will whisk you away into glory to be with the Father of lights at your last breath. None of them except Jesus Christ. And so his thing should be the main thing in your life. <clears throat> this, this crazy adventure of Joshua and the Jewish nation, you know, crossing the river and and uh, conquering kings and screaming at walls and having them come down and sending out spies and recruiting prostitutes and building memorials and all that stuff. It's all a, a cool story and everything. They make a great movie, I believe. But it's, it's, way, it's, it's much, much more than that. You know, if you look over, and I hope you will sometime, if you look over in Psalm 105, um, basically what's happening in that psalm is... is the story of Joshua and Moses and the people of Israel is being, it's kind of like bullet pointed. Like he didn't tell every single thing, but it's the story of them going from Egypt to the promised land and kind of uh, narrating through that whole story. And what it says in verse 45, it, it, this is awesome. It says this, all this happened so they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. The reason why he did all this was that they would now follow him. That's it. And here's the thing. It's the same for us. He wrote this stuff down so we would follow his decrees and his instructions. And we know that because Romans 15.4 says that such things were written in the scriptures to teach us. So he, he had them go through this whole thing he, so that they would obey him and follow him. And then he had people inspired by the Spirit to jot this stuff down so you would know, so likewise you would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. That's what he does. We read these things so we could understand who he is. We read these things so we can understand who we are. And we can read these things when those two things come in contact with each other, we hopefully understand our need for a Savior, a Yeshua, a Deliverer, and so we bend the knee to Jesus. And so we come to the conclusion of our series. And the same question tonight as I asked you the first night back on June 24th. With all this stuff that you've gone through, with all the stuff that you saw the people of Israel go through, and all the stuff that you've gone through in your whole life, and listen, you know it's coming, right? You know it's coming. Fear, danger, tough situations, High expectations laid upon you. I don't know what's coming, but it's coming, right? Look at your neighbor and say, it's coming. Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming, right? So listen, you know it's coming. We're all smart people, right? We know it's coming. God's made some promises to help you. You want good results. All those things come together, right? For this ultimate question, choose today who you will serve. Choose today who you'll serve. Joshua follows it up. He says, listen, I don't know about you all, but as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. That means, G that means Joshua says, listen, I, 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 don't even, I don't even know what my son or my daughter are going to do, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to teach my kids what it looks like to serve the Lord. I'm going to stick it out and be a man and be strong and courageous. I'm going to follow the Lord even when it's scary. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show my wife, I'm going to show my kids what it means to follow the Lord and be obedient to his word. That's what I'm going to do. He made the decision. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what you guys are going to do. <laughs> but I know what I'm going to do. Because I know I want something good in the future. And I can't make it happen. There's more than caution tape at the, at the self-help aisle at the store for me. I don't want to go down that aisle because I, I, I can't come up with anything good. <laughs> I've been trying. It's just not working out. So I'm just going to make a decision. I want you to make that same decision too. I hope and pray that you will to serve the Lord. That's what I hope and pray that you'll do.